Welcome back to Aurora Tech Channel. Today, I will test a new AMS dryer from iBOS. This dryer comes with two versions, a four-chamber version and a two-chamber version. The four-chamber model costs $179, while the two-chamber model costs $119. The features are basically identical, with the only difference being the number of chambers. In this video, I will mainly focus on the four-chamber version and see how it performs with the original AMS, which I've been using with the X1 Carbon for about three years. I generally don't review Bamboo Lab mods that involve firmware since Bamboo Lab's firmware is closed sourced. Even if a device works now, there's no guarantee it will continue to work in the future. However, this AMS dryer replaces the lid of the AMS and adds a drying function. It has its own independent power supply, and neither the AMS nor the Bamboo Lab printer can detect that anything is attached, so it basically operates completely on its own. I recently reviewed the Bamboo Lab H2D and H2C, both of which come with the AMS2 Pro. That version includes a built-in filament dryer, but it does not allow continuous heating while printing. The original AMS, on the other hand, does not include any drying capability at all. The iBoss dryer is designed specifically for the first generation AMS and limits the maximum temperature to 65 degrees Celsius to ensure safe operation. It offers three operating modes. The first is drying mode, which allows the dryer to run at the maximum temperature for the most effective filament drying. The second is printing mode, also also called second stage drying, which uses a slightly lower temperature to prevent the filament from softening and jamming the gears during printing. The third is storage mode, which is disabled by default and automatically activates when the humidity inside the unit rises above a preset level, allowing it to function as a filament storage system. Each chamber can be configured independently with its own temperature, drying time, and one of three heating levels. This allows all four chambers to dry different filaments at the same time with fully independent control. Most filament dryers require you to manually open vents or caps to release moist air during the drying process, but on this unit, each chamber's vent opens and closes automatically. In this video, in addition to testing PLA and PETG, I will also test more moisture-sensitive materials such as TPU and PA6 carbon fiber nylon to see how this dryer performs across a wider range of filaments. I would like to thank iBOS for sending us this device and for sponsoring today's video. As always, even though this is a sponsored review, I will still point out any cons or issues I find during testing. This gives buyers a realistic expectation before deciding whether to purchase the device and also helps the manufacturer understand what can be improved on in future updates. With that said, let's get started. The machine came with an outer shipping box and an inner retail box. All components were protected with laser-cut foam. There were more parts than I expected. We have the top lid with four independent heaters, several dividers to separate four chambers, a power hub to split power to all heaters, four controller screens, and some brackets and heat blockers to prevent heat from entering the AMS gears, and the base that contains other electronic components. Some assembly is required, but it is relatively straightforward. First, I removed the AMS and took off the original lid by unscrewing the four screws at the bottom, then attached the dryer lid. After flipping it over, I installed the four legs. I then rotated it 180 degrees to access the back where all the heaters are located. I connected one USB-C cable to each heater, installed the power splitter hub, and mounted the four controllers at the front connecting all the cables. Finally, I installed the dividers to separate the four chambers, as well as the heat blockers used to reduce heat entering the AMS unit. That is all that is required, and the device is ready to be powered on. You can turn on all chambers, or only the one you need to heat. Next, I ran some temperature tests. My room temperature was about 17 to 18 degrees Celsius, which is slightly lower than a typical 25 degrees Celsius indoor environment. I turned on all four chambers and set the temperature to the maximum. For the heat level, I set it to level one, with the maximum being level three. After about 30 minutes, the two middle chambers had reached the target temperature, while the first and last chambers were slightly lower. After about an hour, the two center chambers reached 66 degrees Celsius, as measured by the built-in sensors, while the external sensors measured 1 to 2 degrees higher. The first and last chambers were about 1 to 2 degrees lower. Overall, they were all within a reasonable range. 
When heating all four chambers at the same time, the maximum power draw was about 250 watts, with occasional spikes to 270 watts. Everything appeared to be working normally. However, in real-world use, a filament spool blocks airflow, so I do not expect any filament dryer to provide completely even temperatures throughout the spool. To evaluate this, I attach three sensors to a spool, one at the top, one at the bottom, and one in the middle. I also placed another sensor at the top of the lid, which is the point farthest from the heat source. All wires were tucked into gaps so the lid could close completely. The power level was initially set to level 1, but since a spool was inside, I increased it to the maximum power. At maximum, the unit consistently drew about 70 watts. I let it heat for an hour before checking the temperatures. After about an hour, the built-in sensor showed 65 degrees Celsius. Let's also take a look at the temperature measurements at different spots when a spool is placed inside and blocks the airflow. The sensor at the top of the spool measured around 55 degrees Celsius. The bottom sensor, where hot air blows directly, measured 69.3 degrees Celsius. The sensor at the center of the spool measured 52.2 degrees Celsius. The coolest point was at the top of the lid near the intake fan, which is the end of the heat circulation path, measuring 44.5 degrees Celsius. As expected, with a real spool inside blocking airflow, some temperature variation is unavoidable for filament dryers with a single heat source. Among the sensors attached to the spool, the highest temperature was about 4.3 degrees higher than the target, and the lowest was about 12.8 degrees lower. One thing to keep in mind is that my garage temperature was around 17 to 18 degrees Celsius, which is cooler than a typical indoor home or office environment. Overall, I would give the temperature performance a pass. It is in line with other filament dryers I have tested, and none perform significantly better or worse than the others. I will test the dryer with different types of filament. Instead of soaking them in water, I intentionally ruined them using a setup closer to a real-world scenario. Since it has been raining and foggy in the Bay Area, I left two spools of filament, one PLA and one PETG, outdoors for three days so they could absorb a significant amount of moisture. After that, I brought them back and loaded them into the AMS without drying them first. As soon as I closed the lid, the humidity inside the dryer jumped to over 70%, with the PETG chamber reaching close to 80%. I started with a PLA Benji, using the default PLA profile, and a maximum speed of 300 millimeters per second. As you can see, this is a typical surface produced by moist filament, with blobs all over the print. When the extruder retracts, the stringing is also much worse than what you would expect from a normal print. This PLA Benji clearly shows that leaving the filament outdoors for three days is more than enough to ruin it. Next, I printed a PETG Benji. PETG appears to absorb even more moisture, and the surface quality looks even worse. The result is awful, which confirms that the moisture exposure was very effective. I then dried both filaments for 6 hours. For PLA, I will use 50 degrees. For PETG, I will use 55 degrees. The humidity inside the box was still relatively high, around 65-70%. to 70%. I set the heating level to level 1, since we only needed to reach 50 and 55 degrees, and did not require level 3. When the drying cycle started, two vents at the back opened automatically. After about 30 minutes, the temperature stabilized, and I let the 6-hour cycle finish before reprinting the PLA Benchy. This time, the PLA print looked like a normal Benchy. There was some very minor stringing, but overall the print quality was decent, and there was really not much to complain about. Compared with the previous print, the difference was huge. I then printed the PETG Benchy again.
This time, there were no blobs on the surface, and the stringing was much better and very close to normal. There was a small filament residue at the back. When zooming in, it looked like residue from the nozzle stuck inside the steering wheel of the boat. Compared with the moistened PETG print, the improvement was even more obvious than with PLA. I also tested TPU. For TPU, I did not take it outdoors like the PLA and PETG. Since it has been raining, the humidity in my garage is about 75%, which is already bad enough for TPU, so I left it there for three days. Because standard 95 ATPU cannot be printed through the AMS, I hung the moistened filament on my Prusa Mark IV enclosure and fed it directly into the extruder. When printing TPU, the default profile sets the flow rate to 3.6 mm cubed per second, which limits the maximum speed to around 45 mm per second. For TPU, there is no need to do anything extreme. Simply letting it absorb moisture from the garage is enough to cause problems. The result was very poor, with bubbles all over the surface and severe stringing, making the print unusable. For nylon PA6CF, which is even more moisture sensitive than TPU, I did not remove it from my airtight storage box, which is maintained at around 35-40% to humidity most of the time. I print it directly from the storage container. For most other filaments, drying is not strictly necessary before printing, but nylon is different, especially PA6, which is more moisture sensitive than PA12. This is a typical result from undried nylon. The surface itself is not too bad, but there is a lot of stringing when the print head travels and the filament retracts. The large cylinder was actually not too bad since it involved minimal retraction, but stringing was still present throughout the print. I then loaded both TPU and nylon into the dryer and set the temperatures to 60 degrees Celsius for TPU and 65 degrees Celsius for PA6CF. I started with a 6 hour drying cycle and set the heating level to the maximum level 3. 65 degrees for 6 hours is likely not enough for nylon, but I wanted to see how it would perform. After about 20 minutes, both chambers reached over 60 degrees. After about 35 minutes, the nylon chamber reached 65 degrees as well, which is fairly fast considering my room temperature was only 16.5 degrees. After 6 hours, I reprinted the TPU tire while leaving the nylon to dry for a bit longer. This time, the TPU surface looked great with no blobs. There was still some stringing, but compared to the undried print, the improvement was obvious. The remaining stringing was light and easy to remove. For nylon, after drying for 6 hours plus an additional 40 minutes while I was printing the TPU, I reprinted the spool holder. The result looked better, with no obvious surface stringing like before, although it was still not perfectly clean. Since I print frequently with this Sunlu PA6CF, I know that fully dried material can produce even better results. I dried it again, setting the time to the maximum of 24 hours. After a total drying time of about 30 hours, the result was very close to perfect. There was no stringing on the surface, and both the interior and the spool looked very clean. This shows that 65 degrees can still dry nylon effectively, but it takes much longer compared with drying at 90 to 100 degrees, which can achieve excellent results in about 4 hours. Okay, let's talk about the pros and cons of this device, starting with the pros. 1. This AMS dryer doesn't require any software or firmware changes. It simply replaces the AMS lid and transforms the unit into a filament dryer. Installation takes about 20 to 30 minutes and is overall quite straightforward. 2. It heats up pretty quickly and reaches the claim temperature within 20 to 30 minutes. While 65 degrees is not ideal for materials like nylon, the maximum temperature is limited by firmware to protect the AMS. 
The brand told me that they internally tested the heater and confirmed it can heat the chamber up to 100 degrees Celsius, but it cannot do so when installed on the AMS. 3. It has air vents at the back that open automatically when the chamber is heating. When I put my hand next to them, I can feel hot air venting out. This allows it to dry filament more effectively than other dryers, which usually only have a few holes on the top and require you to open them manually for venting. 4. It divides the AMS into four independent chambers, so you can dry anywhere from one to four spools depending on your needs. Since each heater is rated at 65 watts, this design can save a lot of energy. Each chamber can also be set to a different temperature. I really like this design, and it works more effectively than other similar dryers on the market. 5. There are three drying modes, normal drying, second stage drying at lower temperature for printing, and storage mode. I found the storage mode especially useful. You can set each chamber to maintain a different humidity level from 20 to 50%. The system only heats up when a specific chamber exceeds the preset humidity, dries it down to 10%, and then stops. I recorded the energy consumption over 12 hours using storage mode, and it used about 0.75 kilowatt hours. Since the humidity in my garage is quite high, I think you can expect a daily electricity consumption of around 1 to 1.5 kilowatt hours. 6. Besides the chamber dividers, it also includes panels to protect the AMS from excessive heat. I measured the temperature difference as well, and the AMS gearbox and base were about 15 to 20 degrees lower than the chamber temperature. Overall, it is safer than other similar products for long-term use with the AMS. Now for the cons, one. Like most filament dryers, it only has a single heat vent. Once a filament spool is placed inside, it blocks airflow and causes temperature differences in different areas. This seems to be a common issue with all the filament dryers I've tested, as these devices are not high-end precision equipment, that's simply how they work. However, this AMS dryer allows you to continue drying while printing, so as the spool rotates, the filament should dry more evenly and effectively. Two, the maximum drying temperature is set to 65 degrees to avoid damaging the AMS. This lower temperature is perfectly fine for PLA, PETG, and most common filaments, but for extremely moisture-sensitive materials like nylon, it requires much longer drying times to achieve good results. 3. This dryer is intended for and is only compatible with the first gen AMS. The new AMS2 Pro includes a built-in dryer feature, but it can only operate when the printer is not printing. With the AMS2 Pro priced at $300 and the four-chamber version of this dryer costing $180, it can be a tough decision for users to choose between upgrading to the AMS2 Pro or adding this dryer to their existing first-gen AMS. In conclusion, the IBOS AMS dryer does its job well. It's not just another AMS dryer. Its thoughtful design, energy efficiency, and overall level of refinement help it stand out. I would say it is the best AMS dryer currently on the market. The price is not cheap, but if you are looking for a dryer for a first-generation AMS, this is the best option available. One thing I would like to remind you of is that when the printer is printing, you should use the second stage drying mode, which reduces the temperature by 10 to 15 degrees. I also tested another Sunlu dryer with the AMS and printed nylon at 70 degrees. It didn't cause any damage, but I only printed a few models. For long-term use, it's safer to use a lower temperature while printing to ensure that you do not damage your AMS. If you're interested in the IBOS dryer, I included the link in the description. Please also check out my website, auroratechchannel.com, which tracks prices for major 3D printers, laser engravers, and CNC machines to help you find great deals. That's it for this video. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like and consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.